Uh, please welcome to the stage Kiel Arnward, Project Manager at Etron and Audi. Thank you. I think we should start off with a movie, right? Let's go, go ahead. Let's... I know what you're thinking. Electric, it's not for you. And you're probably right. Electric just doesn't have enough range. It will never survive the winter. Everyone knows water and electricity don't mix. No more hanging out here either. And charging stations? Good luck finding one of those. Electric is just too ahead of its time. So, maybe an electric car isn't for you after all. Or is it? Well, for those of you who thought my name doesn't sound very German, you're absolutely right. Uh, I'm, I'm actually from Norway. You know that country your neighbors are trying to steal our deal with the EU? Right? We have like 32 people, inhabitants, and everyone owns an electric car. <laughs> um, now, electric has gone Audi. This is uh, the term we use. And, and personally, I went electric uh, 10 years ago. I actually joined Audi just one year ago. Uh, before that, I was uh, over seven years with Tesla. Uh, and I, I want to just start off by telling you a little story, because I'm not what you would say an environmentalist. You know, I didn't really care about the environment. I, I love cars too much to care about that. That's going to be my children's problem. <laughs> it's a very bad way of saying it, just joking. But the um, thing is, I'm very passionate about cars. And uh, I had an epiphany uh, a few years ago. Uh, and I want to tell that story because um, I have a daughter who's seven years old. And when she was, I think she was around four years old, she experienced for the first time something that was very common to me. Uh, for the weekend, I had borrowed my friend's car, which was a very high-performance V8 car, and he had borrowed my Tesla Roadster, which I had at that time. And um, when, when Sunday morning, uh, sorry, Monday morning came and I was going to take my daughter to the kindergarten, uh, I wanted to stop and fill up the tank on this car because I wanted to deliver it back to my friend with a full tank. So I stopped at the petrol station before I dropped my kid off. And when I sat back in the car, my daughter asked me, what did you do? And I, I didn't think about it. I said, oh, I just filled up the car. And then I drive away. And of course, I'm, uh, I'm a moron. So I rev the car and I smile like an idiot because I like the sound of that car. Uh, and my daughter asked me, why is this car so loud? And I said, well, it's because it's very fast. And then she said, well, is it faster than our Tesla? And I said, no. And I felt very proud that she cared about the Tesla being the fastest car. Uh, and I didn't think about it anymore. But then I dropped her off, and I sat back in the car. And I thought, god, I'm such a moron. Because first of all, it's my daughter's first experience of going somewhere to fill up your car. Why don't we just do it at home like any other device we have? And it's her experience of a car making a lot of noise that makes her more on father smile. And it's not even faster than what we have. So this sort of gives you the epiphany of where we are in terms of a change of paradigm. And that's why I want to start off by showing you this, uh, this here. Now, this isn't my numbers. This is actually McKinsey and company, the consultancy company, who uh, presented the, the growth of full electric cars and plug-in hybrids over the past seven years. And of course, I like to take credit for all these numbers, since I've been doing nothing but electric cars for seven years. But uh, I think what you see here is a clear, uh, it's a clear mix of, of a rapid uh, transition over to electrified vehicles. So for, for us, who comes from uh, our heritage of constantly testing and con constantly questioning and constantly improving, 
this felt very natural for us then to say, okay, if, if this is truly the path ahead to go electric, then we need to do it our way. We need to put our DNA in this. And I have a picture here of the Audi Quattro, presented some 40 years ago now, with the first conventional four-wheel drive system to be placed in a, in, in a car. And for us, this, this holds the very core of our DNA. And it's actually the reason why the car out there is called the Audi e-tron, is to pay respect to the Audi Quattro. It just needs one name, like Sting or Queen. <laughs> okay. So uh, coming, uh, the future model of, models of Audi will, of course, uh, have a model name and the wording e-tron next to it. So that, that means fully electric going forward. Uh, what we mean in terms of our strategy is that we want to make sure that in 2025, every third Audi sold is going to be electrified. And with an electrified Audi, just like you saw from the McKinsey uh, diagram, we need to be aware that not everyone is ready to go fully electric. And then it makes sense to just have what we call P uh, BEVs, which is battery electric vehicles, and then PHEVs, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, for those markets where the infrastructure is just not there or people aren't quite ready or capable of only relying on electric power alone. Now, we need to ask ourselves why. Why do we do this? Why should we go electric? Why, like, are we doing it because we want to save the environment? You know, make sure the polar bears of Norway isn't turned into brown bears? Uh, and, or do we do it because of the CO2 regulations? There's quite a lot of strict uh, regulations coming now from cities. Uh, and is that why we're doing it? Or is it because the competition is doing it? Everyone else is doing it, that's why we should do it as well. Or is it because the oil prices are so high now that the petrol prices are so high, it just makes sense to sort of do something else. And it's not any of, it's a combination here, of course, but the main reason why we go electric is because it's better. That's the first principle of why you should do it. It's the absolute truth of why you go from one thing to another. And take this as an example. Some 150 years ago, we, we drove around in, not we, obviously, but our ancestors, or they drove around in horse and carriage, right? And we didn't suddenly start driving cars because there was a lot of petrol stations popping up. We went into a car because it was a better way of getting around. And the same thing is happening now with electric. It has to be a better car for the transition to happen, and then the charging stations will, of course, follow naturally as a result of that. And why do customers buy electric cars? This is also interesting, and I've sold and overseen thousands of, uh, of, of deliveries of electric cars over the years, and I've owned one personally for the past 10 years as well, still do. Uh, and the main reasons why people are doing this is these five blocks, from, from my experience. It varies, of course, but it is environmental friendliness is important. It's not the key driver, unfortunately not. It should be, but it's not. Efficiency, you need to be value for money. Consumption, that needs to be to pay off well. Safety, it needs to be a safe car to transport your family and your kids. Performance, of course, it needs to have acceptable performance and costs. Now, whenever you get into this argument of environmental friendliness, there's always this, oh, but what if the energy comes from a coal plant and it's not renewable? And absolutely, uh, an electric car isn't 100% pollution free. Not in production and not in consumption, especially if the, if the electricity comes from coal. But take this as an example. If you have a diesel car, then go into a garage, lock the garage, open your windows, and start the car and sit there for three hours. You probably won't do that. Do the same thing with an electric car, no problem at all. The point is, local emissions are the, are the ones, the thing that we need to handle and tackle first. That's what, peop what gets people sick in cities, and that's what kills. So, environmental friendliness is a very, very key factor. Efficiency. When you go downhill, with an electric car, you get fuel back into your tank. How is that possible with a diesel or petrol car? It would be like somebody running next to you with a jerry can filling up your tank when you go downhill. So you're using the, the kinetic energy that is basically lost 
to regain fuel, which is much more efficient. Safety, performance, and cost, I'll come back to that in a little while. But first of all, I asked my, uh, my kids who loves to play with Lego, I do too, by the way, <laughs> still do, <laughs> uh, and I asked, them to, uh, I asked them to build me two cars. Uh, one of them is supposed to be a diesel petrol car, and the other one is supposed to be electric. See what they created? This one. Uh, I started asking my daughters, okay, they, they, they've nailed the, you know, the, the exhaust pipes here, and they've nailed even ventilation because the car needs to breathe, it gets warm. These were their responses, by the way. I didn't give them any guidance at all of how to build this. And I asked them, why is, it, why is it so big? Well, they're usually very big, these big SUVs driving around, right? And then I asked them, OK, but what about this weird-looking thing right here? Why, is it, why does it look like that? And I said, well, electric cars are usually sleek and fishy-like. And they have no idea why it is like that. They don't understand you know, air efficiency and drag and all these things. But that's just how they view an electric car. And they opened this, and I asked them, well, why isn't, uh, what is this? It's like, well, place to put your makeup. <laughs> I have two girls, by the way. <laughs> uh, and, and also, I asked my youngest, my seven-year-old, I asked her, OK, but what about these, purple, these pink lights? And her response was, well, it needs to be pretty. <laughs> so that's, in their view, how the difference is viewed from them. Um, but to go a little bit deeper into our technology, you can also use Lego as a reference, because anyone here build Lego before? I, I guess you all have, right? When you build a car in Lego, what is the first thing you do? You make a frame, right? And what happens if you don't strengthen that frame with some flooring or some, some cross lines or something like that? It's going to fall apart. So what do you think happens if you put a solid, sorry, if you put a solid block of battery within the frame. It becomes more than just performance and, and rigidness and handling. It becomes extremely secure for especially side collision impact, and it protects the occupants of the car even better. And also, the motor in front is 30% the size of a V6 TDI. And you might think that, oh, it's good to have something there because it takes up the, the force of the collision. And it's actually not, because in physics, that is a solid block of material that goes into your knees in a collision. So the more emptiness you can have in the front, the more collision zone, crumple zone, you can build in, meaning a stronger, a stronger construction that is less likely to cause harm to the occupants in the car. Like I said, Battery in the floor increases rigidity and side collision safety. And again, there's no need for a petrol diesel tank, so you can utilize that, utilize that again as collision, uh, uh, collision zones. And also, or practicality. You know, open the, the, the rear floor of the trunk of the e-tron we have outside, and you see a gigantic smuggler's room where you can put things you want to sell to your neighbors in the UK when they leave EU. Or <laughs> <laughs> whatever, uh, Guinness or whiskey or something. <laughs> now, uh, costs. Uh, I think it's also important for us to, to, uh, to be aware that we, we need to simplify this a little bit, because it's strange for people to go from, from understanding how, uh, how you calculate liters per 10 kilometers, and then suddenly start talking about watts and kilowatts, and, you know, Unless you've been living that, that electric vehicle life for a long time, you, you don't understand it right away. So I'm going to break it down a little, uh, uh, in a way I like to understand it, because I need to dumb things down for myself to understand sometimes. So bear with me. Now, uh, you all recognize this right here, OK? So one liter of petrol for a car that uses 0 0.5 liters per 10 kilometers will take that car 20 kilometers. Right? Simple enough. And the price for, pet, for one liter of petrol in Ireland is around 135 cents, 1.35 euros. Right? I didn't mess up my, my research <laughs> too much. OK, so let's then 
think how much will it cost for an electric car to drive the exact same distance? You know, take consumption out of the picture, take range out of the picture. Let's look at the hardcore facts and costs. Now, that means we have to know the cost of electricity in Ireland, but luckily I've done that research too. Uh, that means we have to use the consumption number for an electric car, which is watt hours instead of liters per 10 kilometers. We use watt hours per kilometers. Let's say it's 200 times that by 20, and the average cost of an electricity price in Ireland, which is, by the way, half of what it is in Germany, so I kind of envy you that. Uh, that means that to drive 20 kilometers with a fully electric car is going to cost you 0 0.65 euros. And also, be aware that electricity is the only fuel offered for free. That's not my opinion, that's a fact especially here in Ireland, where you have a lot of free public charging. You have airports, shopping centers, uh, sports arenas, where they offer uh, electricity with your parking. And although you might pay for parking, you pay the, the exact same fee for parking like your, uh, the car standing next to you, which is a petrol diesel car. And I don't see anybody filling up their tank when they're at the shopping center. But you have a, a charging station, probably. So. It's also important. Over the course of a year, actually, uh, circa 50% is only done home charging on your own grid. And this is numbers from the Iris, uh, uh, Irish Census, your statistics uh, agency, saying that 50% is done at home, the, less is, uh, the rest is done at work or yeah, shopping centers or, or school or whatever. But we, of course, will make it easy for people to charge when they are on the road, and we are building up Ionity. This is a fast charging network that we've gone together with other car manufacturers, and going to make sure that we, go, that we share that cost and investment to make sure we build up these fast charging stations. Um, there's six locations already planned for Ireland, as far as I know. So this is being rolled out this year and the coming years. So it's going to be no problem charging on the road. But in addition to that, in addition to our own network, we know that the current situation in EU looks like this. This isn't something to come. This is right now. This is what it looks like right now. And this is, this is a cluster of many different suppliers uh, that, that offers high power charging. But in order to access these, you need various apps and, and RFID chips and everything to sort of get the power. So we thought, well, why not just have one card that can access most of them? So that's what we did. We created the e-tron charging service card. One bill, one access, one card, so that you don't need all these different tools. Again, making it simple. I'm not going to go every single one of these topics right here. You'll be able to see the car outside, and you don't need me to tell you uh, what it looks like or how it feels. You can feel for yourself. But I want to touch on something that I think is very important. First of all, 150 kilowatt hours of, of charging. I'll explain that in a second, what that actually means, so you can understand it. Uh, no brakes breaking. I really like this, because people talk about one pedal driving. I like no pedal driving, meaning you can just take your foot off the pedal and use the paddles on the steering wheel to increase or decrease the regeneration, the braking, of the car, which then gives you energy back into the tank. So uh, we also, in terms of the design of the car, it was our goal to make sure that this car isn't viewed as, oh, look, that's that electric Audi. You know, we want people to see that car and see Wow, that's, that's a nice looking car. And then they learn afterwards that, wow, it's electric even? So you can see that also from the car outside, that it's a lot of, it, it carries a lot of features of the current models of, uh, of our current lineup. Now, charging. So this sounds very complex, but let me explain it. Uh, in terms of fast charging, DC charging, there is something called uh, SOC, state of charge, and then the speed of the charge, how, how much power you get into the tank in, in the course of your charging uh, sequence. Uh, now, this shows you 
it, I can relate it to, uh, let's say you stop at a petrol station and you start filling up your tank. And halfway into you filling your tank, the, the, the petrol pistol that you put in turns into a straw instead of a normal nostril. Suddenly it's going to take a lot longer time to fill up that tank. And that's what this means. It means that for the iPACE, uh, and this is from an article done by Inside EV, you see that it has quite high amount of DC power, which is on this section right here, uh, all the way up until the battery is halfway full. And then it starts dropping, you know, it starts to become a straw. So it would be like plugging in your phone, and it's 2% left battery on your phone, and the first up to 50% uh, of charging takes you two minutes, and the rest takes you 52 minutes. It's annoying. Same thing with the Mercedes EQC, and to Mercedes' defense, this is a prototype, so it will probably look better. I hope it will. But same story here. Look, at around 40% battery, it starts to drop. Same thing with Tesla. Here, 45, 50%, it starts dropping again. Now look at our e-tron. All the way up to 80%, even 90% in some cases, we see that we have the full amount of power the car can take. That's why it's very, uh, it's very, we have to be careful comparing the different electric cars, because a battery isn't a battery. Uh, there's a lot of different technologies, but the most important thing for a battery to function uh, uh, optimal, optimally is temperature management. And this is something we spent a lot of resource and a lot of effort into making sure we do right, so that you aren't stuck at a charging station and you, you see that it starts slowing down. It shouldn't. It should carry the high power for as long as possible. Now, obviously, we launched the e-tron that you can see outside, but we have also uh, we have a full wholehearted commitment. We will later this year we will start diving into the the, the coupe version of the of the e-tron called the e-tron Sportback. We showed a prototype of this car in Geneva. Uh, we've also shown my personal favorite, the beautiful Q4 concept, uh, which is also coming uh, in in just uh, a year or so. And then we have the beautiful e-tron GT. But this is not all. From now until, actually from last year, until 2025, we will present 12 fully electric Audis in pretty much every segment. And this shows the, the seriousness of what we mean that electric has gone Audi. Electric is our future, and we will make sure that we produce the same quality cars that you expect already from our current lineup, and it will be an electric car available in every segment. Thank you so much for listening to me, and please don't hesitate to ask me questions afterwards if you can find me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>